we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's family. It's no secret that a massive shift in global economic power is underway from west to east. But the question is whether the old developed economies are ready for the consequences of that change. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Are we at one of those moments in history in which there is uh, the necessity for a new world order? A, because of what's taken place in the Middle East, the rise of, of different kinds of groups, and B, what's happened in Asia, meaning that the, the, there has been a shift from the West to the East. Uh. There's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of, th of the world. Are you optimistic a global system can happen, it, from what it, we've heard so far? It, it, it could happen, and in fact it's in the works. but they really are issues of the construction of a new world order. That's what this is about. And that's the sort of dialogue the Chinese are generally good at. And, as, and so a partnership between us is essential. A conflict between us is going to exhaust us both in tactical exercises that cannot be conclusive. The order could satisfy both. It has to satisfy both, because otherwise it will lead to tensions that will exhaust us both. Hello and welcome. We're back for another reading of Code Word Barbalon, 666 Danger in the Vatican, Book 1, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. And I am joined here with your Glissman in Belgium. Here we are. <laughs> and your Are you there? Yes, I am there. Hello, brother Brett. <laughs> Hello. Thanks. Please announce for our, our listeners. The topic of today, please. The topic of today is, of course, still reading in the book Cold World Babylon, uh, the sons of Loyola and their plans for world domination. And for their world domination, they need what they call a new world order. The <laughs> new world order, as you probably also heard that term already, and when you type that into Wikipedia, you will get a between brackets new world order between brackets it's a conspiracy theory, even though. Popes have spoken about it, American presidents have spoken about it, Joe Biden has spoken about it a few years ago when he addressed the American troops. And um, there are so many people who speak of a new world order who are in quote-unquote high places that I don't even understand why in Wikipedia that is still a quote-unquote conspiracy theory. Oh, now, because if, they want the new world order to be, well, it's <clears throat> the righteous order of God, see? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the god the, of this world. The point is that if we had Tom Fress on the broadcast today, we would probably not do a, a lot of reading because he would extensively oh. go over that point that the new world order is n actually nothing else but the old world order restored, in which he has absolutely 
Um, yep. Uh, uh, hit the nail uh, on, on, on the right top. Right on the no? head. Yeah, right yeah, on the head. slammed you know? it in one swing. Yeah, slam dunk. <laughs> slam dunk yep. home run, you know? Yep. Uh, yep. The new world order is actually only the old world order restored, but therefore people have to know what the old world order is. And oh, people- and they don't want that. Oh, why would we want to study history? I mean, it's boring and dusty old books. Yuck. People most yeah, of right. the time don't know what the old world order is because they are not educated in real history. No, they are not. educated in what we read the chapter before, the Jesuit assignment, uh, Jesuit schools, Catholic learning, learning against learning. And they have oftentimes not any knowledge of the Reformation, let alone the Counter-Reformation. Even though that is for people who are have heard, who have heard about it, hard to grasp, but there are a lot of people who have never heard about the Reformation in the way that we studied people have heard about it and surely have not heard about the Counter-Reformation. So when you tell them that the new world order is nothing else but the old world order restored, they're going to look at you as if you have two hats because they just don't understand. Well, the two hats brings us, of course, to the symbol that is used here on page 154 (laughs) in the beginning of this chapter, two hats of that eagle that uh, is representative for the new world order. And the point is, a, a new world order, willing or not, ready or not, I mean, when I read the sentence, ready or not, then it always is, uh, uh, ready or not, here I come, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is exactly what yeah. the new world order is going to do. Oh, it yeah. will stand there overnight, because it is planned already in a long time. But now, let's go a little bit into the point that Tom Fress would make. What is the old world order restored? The old world order restored is the papacy at its high point of authority. At the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century, nothing in this world could top on the power that the Pope at that time had. He was the sole ruler over all the kings of the Western Hemisphere. He ordained kings, he put them into power, and as long as they did what he told them, they were reigning over the people. And at the moment, they did not do what he told them anymore. They were not reigning over the people anymore. There are incidents enough, like, for example, Henry IV of Germany in uh, thousand something when he went to Canossa. Uh, that is one of the examples where the Pope excommunicated a king and by that took all the power of him away. So the Pope ruled supreme, and then came the Reformation, then came the light in this world, the light in the form of the Bible, most and for all through the work of Martin Luther, who translated the Bible into German, and with that set almost half of Europe free from the 1520s on, which resulted in 1529 at the... Um, at this one meeting, I, I don't come to the name right now, where that was exactly, mm-hmm. um, where the name Protestant was formed in 1529, and then one year later, in 1530, you had that edict at, uh, at Augsburg, um, where all that was confirmed again, and there you had officially the Protestants. Oh, yes. <clears throat> I think it was the Diet of Spires, here. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That You're was welcome. Diet of Spires, yeah. So at the, Diet of, at the Diet of Spires in, 19, in 1529, the term yeah. Protestants was formed for the first time. Right. And yeah. um, then a few mm-hmm. years later, of course, the Jesuits were formed, and that was the Counter-Reformation. And they were formed to bring back the ultimate, uh, the, 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 the ultramontane power of the Pope that he had before. Mm. And of course, the White Pope is only a figurehead for the Black Pope who is behind him. So, actually, any, anyway, the way you see it, whether you see the white pope rules or the black pope rules, any quote-unquote pope, the Antichrist of the Bible, is just a mask of which, uh, uh, where Satan hits behind. Yeah? It's just the human mask where the power of Satan hits behind. And yeah, the devil Satan, keeps changing his name because he doesn't want any no, anyone to know who he is. And yeah. Satan is Simple not... That. And, Satan is not a person. Satan is a spirit. Satan is an angel. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And right. therefore, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what mm-hmm. 
So I just want to cut the chop because otherwise I'm doing like Tom Fress and speaking an hour about that without coming to the point of making uh, making the reading. And we have quite a chapter here because this is going on for a few pages, and I really want to go into that. Yeah. And um, yes. it starts it starts with a quote: uh, "Cats sneak up on their prey." Yeah, probably you know that best, Brett, because you have a few cats right there at home, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. I got two of them. Yeah, that's right. And they, then, of, and then of they course, actually yeah. gang up too. They they conspire. Yeah, they do. They do conspiracy. See, oh, see, so you, you can't tell people that. Well, you know, even cats conspire. No, no, no. They don't do that. No, no, no. Come on. <laughs> Nature can teach us quite a bit without man involved. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lions are cats, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When lions go to the chase uh, to oh, get yeah. their prey, they work together. So they work together. They work. To, right. They work together against their prey. What is that? But a conspiracy. That's right. <laughs> that's that's the term Simple of a conspiracy. As that. Simple as that. It sure is. Yeah, yeah. it is. Conspiracies all over. And here's yeah, another are. conspiracy in the Bible mentioned in Genesis chapter eleven, yes, verse four. You. Go Please. to, let us build a city. And a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. That is what they mm. said in Babylon, Babylon. at that time. Oh. Now we start reading on page 154 in this book. And um, I'm just going to go directly into a footnote because the very first um, mentioning of uh, um, New World Order here directly comes from a quote from Jesuit professor Malachi Martin. From his book, The Keys of This Blood, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for Control of the New World Order. And this book is uh, published in 1991. And when you want to understand Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for Control of the New World Order, go to Tapa Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil, and just read the first chapter, Subliminal Rome. And you will understand what this is all about that also is a book that was published in the end oh, of the 1990s book. this that book published in 1991 and then you will have a real true understanding about that uh, holy alliance that was set at that time Malachi Martin speaks about that in a few different words but he speaks about that in his book the keys of this blood and the subtitle of that book is The Struggle for World Domination Between Pope John Paul II, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the Capitalist West. Yeah? And from this book, now, uh, P.D. Stewart says here, In 1990, the Jesuit professor Malachi Martin wrote a book, The Keys of This Blood. In that book, Malachi Martin states that in 1976, Pope John Paul II, while he was still Cardinal Wojtyla, because he became Pope in 1978, the year of the three Popes, you know, when the first Pope, Paul VI, died, and then Pope John Paul I came into office and died after 33 days, because he was assassinated, and then John Pope, uh, Pope John Paul II came, and that is the year of the three Popes, 1978. So in 1976, while he was still Cardinal Wojtyla, stood before an audience in New York City and made one of the most or prophetic speeches ever given. Quote, we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. Wide circles of American society and wide circles of the Christian community do not realize this fully. Unquote. What did he mean? Now, Malachi Martin explains, quote, Heaven's agenda, the grand design of God for the new world order had begun. John Paul was more than a geopolitical giant of his age. He was and remains the serene and confident servant of the grand design. Malachi adds on page 484 in his book, when the penetration is consummated, it will be the end game par excellence. Unquote. Now, what is the end game and the grand design? And why is the Pope so confident of the outcome? Well, when we are reading here two times already about the quote unquote grand design, 
I can advise you to get a book that is called The Grand Design Exposed by author John Daniel. And you will also learn a lot about this. But P.D. Stewart continues, what if I told you that there is a highly secret body of secret initiates, the Council of Emperors of the East and West, who are determined to bring about a new world order, a Novus Ordo Seclorum, or that they have repeatedly initiated a series of international crises in order to achieve their objective, using Machiavellian schemes, legal machinations from the very bowels of Western democracies, which have been approved by the people in the name of preserving Western values and national security? Is this just another one of those outrageous conspiracy theories, as Bush called it? Not at all. On January 1st, 2004, Catholic News Network Oh, oh no! I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, cable <laughs> News Network. Oh, you mean can Candy Nugget News? <laughs> sorry. Found that Ted Turner, Knight of Malta of CNN, reported, "Quote: Pope John Paul II rang in the new in the new year on Thursday with a renewed call for peace in the Middle East and Africa and the creation of a new world order." Unquote. One well-known Jesuit has referred to this as the Pope's grand design. I now invite the reader to consider the following imperious declarations from James Warburg and former President George H. W. Bush Sr. On February 17, 1950, speaking on behalf of the powerful Rothschild dynasty, Warburg announced, quote, We shall have world government whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. Unquote. Almost half a decade later, in 1991, and let me be more specific, on September 11th, 1991, Thank you. As far as I know, because here in the book it is said, it is uh, a State of the Union address on January 29th, 1991, but I have seen references that that was a speech made on 9-11, 1991. Right. Anyway, yeah, let's right. not discuss about that. It's maybe the one or the other. The point is not so much when he right. did it. He did more than for, one. Your, he did one, more yeah, than one. Probably. That's for sure. yeah. the, mm. the point is what he said. Yes. So almost half a decade later, in 1991, President George Herbert Walker Bush Sr., in his State of the Union address, again referred to the grand design, quote, it is a big idea. A new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law, unquote. Now, allow me to give a little bit of explanation in the words that he used here. And you can be sure that every word that he used has the meaning that he wanted it to have. Where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause to achieve the universal aspirations. What is another word for universal? Catholic. Every little Roman Catholic child learns that in one of the first lessons of their catechism that mm -hmm. word Catholic is be absolutely 100% equivalent to the word universal. They are absolutely mm -hmm. interchangeable. So when George H. W. Bush here speaks of the universal aspirations of mankind, he speaks of the Catholic aspirations of mankind. And then he says, peace and security. What does the Bible say? The Bible says when they speak of peace and security, sudden destruction will come upon them. He says, freedom and the rule of law. Freedom from the law of the God of the Bible and the rule of law of Satan. This is 
what George H.W. Bush Sr. actually says when he says this. Any comment from you there, Brett? Oh, that's spot on. That's right on it, man. Um, yeah, I uh, put a. I, I think I used that video clip in that uh, that uh, super long two hour teaser we made for All Roads Lead to Rome. Yeah, that's and, possible. Uh, yeah, I did. I put it up in there. But, uh, <clears throat> I haven't watched it in a good. while. I have to say. <laughs> oh, I know. I haven't watched it. No problem. We got plenty <laughs> other things to do. Now, Lincoln Bloomfield continues P.D. Stewart in his book, writes in his book, A World Effectively Controlled by the United Nations, quote, world government will come about through the establishment of supranational institutions characterized by mandatory universal, means Catholic, membership, and some ability to employ physical force. Effective control would thus entail a preponderance of political power in the hands of a supranational organization. Unquote. The Vatican is that supranational organization. Jesuit Malachi Martin wrote in his book, If tomorrow or next week, by a sudden miracle, a one-world government were established, the Catholic Church would not have to undergo any essential structural change in order to retain its dominant position and to further its global aims. Unquote. Now, what is the New World Order? And why do these men means speak of it as though it were a fait accompli? means a fact that has already been accomplished. And as if those of us affected, all of us are in no position to even reverse it. The term New World Order, or NWO, was first brought into public consciousness in 1990 by President George Bush Sr. in a speech he gave before a joint session of Congress. So probably that's the one <laughs> we okay. also know. Yes. Put simply, the New World Order is organized internationalism, an interlocking financial, political, and economic world force for the purpose of establishing a world government. Well, I do not completely agree because I think there is something left out. I'm going to read the sentence again the way that I understand it. Put simply, the New World Order is organized internationalism, an in Interlocking financial, political, economic, and religious world force for the purpose of establishing a world government. Thank you, Yerk. <laughs> Involving. <laughs> That's a very good addition. Yeah, you know. Yeah. This is the reason. <laughs> this is the reason why this is not an audio book, but this is a book discussion. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> little insert here and there. Yeah. Does a little good. Involving helps, helps. involving the conversion of the United Nations and its agencies, complete with a world army, a world parliament, a world court, global taxation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a world religion. Bill Clinton's Jesuit professor, Carol Quigley, explains, probably from his book, uh, Tragedy and hope, yeah, that's right, that's from that book. Wow. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to, to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled by central banks, of the world acting in concert by secret agreements. Unquote. That is from the book Tragedy and Hope. Now, if you ever can lay your hands on that book Tragedy and Hope, which is not so difficult to get, mm -hmm. I dare you to count how often in this 1600 plus pages you read the word Jesuit. <laughs> Because oh. Carol Quigley was a professor at Jesuit-controlled 
University of the Georgetown, as we all mm-hmm. knew from the last meeting, you know? Right. And how often how often do you think, Brett, that word Jesuit appears in this book? Very few times. Well, or is it a, it, is it a it great deal? I don't even know. Time, I haven't read it. Times? I don't know. Does it appear 100 times, 10 times, one time, or zero times? Once. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, only in America. Yeah. Only in America. Now, former Senator Barry Gold. Water wrote at length of what the quote rule of law unquote as Bush called it means. In his autobiography, with no apologies, he said, quote, The CFR, that is the Council on Foreign Relations, is the American branch of a society which organized in England and believes national boundaries should be obliterated and one world rule established. This was this would inevitably be accompanied by a loss of personal freedom, of choice, and the re-establishment of the restraints which provoked the American Revolution. It represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power, political, monetary, intellectual, intellectual, and ecclesiastical, or Religious. Religious? If the, thinks, <laughs> if the reader uh, thinks that this is all somewhat in the realm of conspiracy theories, just too incredible to believe, consider the words of respected United States Congressman Larry P. MacDonald, as written in November. November of 1975, when the congressman spearheaded efforts against the New World Order. He wrote the introduction to the Rockefeller File, Five Term of the United States. He was a Democrat from Georgia's 7th District, and his quote goes as follows. The Rockefeller File is not fiction. It is a compact, powerful, and frightening presentation of what may be the most important story of our lifetime. The drive of the Rockefellers and their allies to create a one-world government combining supercapitalism and communism under the same tent, all under their control. Not one has dared reveal the most vital part of the Rockefeller story, that the Rockefellers, patrons of the Council on Foreign Relations, and their allies have, for at least 50 years, been carefully following a plan to use their economic power to gain political control of first America and then the rest of the world. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I'm convinced there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning and incredibly evil in intent. Unquote. On August 31st, 1983, this Congressman MacDonald was killed aboard Korean Airline 747. I say more on this in Volume 2 of Code Word Babylon. So let's <laughs> take a little while before we get there. Yeah, But you know, while. every reading of this is to put you on the tip of your chair in awaiting the next reading and also, of course, the next book. And uh, I'm going to make the pledge here right now. I am determined to read all two books together with Brett Norman as long as the circumstances will allow us to do that. Right. Yep. Me too, Yerk. There is so much. There is mm. so much that I could comment on this little paragraph from the quote from. Uh, Congressman McDonald. Um, the Rockefeller the, file, yeah. Yeah, you know, mm. this, this is so much to, to, to say about, for example, the Council on Foreign Relations that has mm-hmm. been founded by the Jesuits and every American president of the last 70 years up to this moment, about more or less, has, yeah. has his relations to the Council on Foreign Relations. And for that, I advise you to go to my playlist on my second YouTube channel, Behind the Door of Bill Hughes. There's a video in there where he names by name 
every American president from somewhere in the 1950s on, I think 1958 on or something it was, and his relations to the Council on Foreign Relations up to the, at that time, present, uh, President uh, George W. Bush, Jr., and their affiliation to the Council of Foreign Relations. And of course, when we speak about the Rockefellers, well, the Rockefellers are maybe rich, but the Rockefellers are only rich because the Rothschilds made them rich. And the Rothschilds are the, the guardians of the Vatican treasury. So that means that all that money comes from Rome. Sure does. Yeah, Whether it's Jewish, whether it's Rockefeller, it, it doesn't matter, you know. They yep. are only puppets right. on a string for the right. Vatican, for the Antichrist of the Bible. Let's not lose sight of this very important fact. The papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist and rules all of this. He rules all the powers of the merchants of this earth. And if you say, oh, Jörg, but how, how can you prove that? Well, I can prove that right here with the Bible. When you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 23, it says, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at the at all in the and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Who are the merchants of these earth? Who are the people behind this global agenda? Who are the people behind this economic globalism? I mean, here in Europe we speak since years about Globalization of mm -hmm. of goods, globalization of of companies, mm -hmm. and what what is the consequence of that? That the middle class is being destroyed, but the middle class is just the achievement of the Reformation, of Protestantism. That's right. Without Protestantism sure and the Reformation of the beginning of the 1600s, there would never have been a middle class and that middle mm -hmm. class is dying it's dying in the united states of america it's dying here in europe and there yep. is not and there mm -hmm. is not even a, a middle class to speak about in countries like china and all that stuff right and yep. when that middle class is gone what do you have you have the rich on the one end and you have the poor on the other you have have the free on the one and you have the bond on the other does that ring a bell when you go to maybe revelation 13 yeah. Does that ring a bell? Is anything mm. that we say here conspiracy theory or is it all proven with the Bible? When it says here he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that mm. no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You mean you don't have to have the mark and the name and the number. You have to have or the mark or the name or the number of. Them. Yep. That's this, it. this. I'm, I'm sorry. This requires absolutely more study than we have time to do here. But the point that I want to make is when you read this little paragraph of the Rockefeller file from Larry P. McDonald. Mm -hmm. That when you take the Bible as your authority, you can see that nothing in here is any kind of conspiracy, but it is everything that God has written already 2,000 years ago. Because the book of Revelation was finished in 95, 96 AD. That's almost 2,000 years from where we are now. That was the revelation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior gave this revelation, gave this understanding to John on the mm -hmm. island of Patmos. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to him that he writes it down so that we who now have the light, the word of God in this world can read and understand it. And we are not caught by surprise. No Christian should be caught by surprise what the new world order was. No Christian should ever even ask ask can i stop this no you can't you cannot stop it in this world 
but you can make your peace with Jesus Christ. And whatever oh, that yes. happens in this world, Comment. you will have everlasting peace in all eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please, Brad. Yes, well, you know, it's pretty obvious that our flesh will want to take care of it. Uh, you know, our fleshly members will want to have peace and safety, as the Bible says. When sudden destruction comes upon your flesh, don't be surprised, because that's the way it works. We have to endure with Christ. We have to suffer through the, the growing pain, or the, how does it say? Uh, the pains, the labor pains, yes, that we're going to be feeling soon. You know, I don't know when. I'm not going to say anything there, because I don't know anything about time, you know, because time is irrelevant you know, the body of Christ. It's irrelevant. It's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. We might have to suffer uh, um, some serious persecution, some death. But Can, I, can is, I invent here? Can I interve intervene? Sure, please. You're Jesus Christ said it for himself, and I'm mm -hmm. not quoting Atom, but he said, in this world you will have tribulation and persecution. But, That's it. But don't despair. I have overcome the world. There we go. That's it. And yep. we are with him, aren't we? Yes. When we call absolutely. ourselves Christians, we are members of the body of Christ. We are members, we are citizens of the kingdom of Christ. Yep, as and don't is, doubt it one bit it is, in your mind. Don't it is, doubt it at all. As it is put in the book of Acts, they add it to the kingdom of God daily. Mm -hmm. We all are added to the kingdom of Christ. Our flesh is caught here that's the point it's the flesh isn't here in the antichrist yes. system but our spirit is with god our spirit is with christ is with christ and we only wait until this flesh dies off so mm -hmm. that we can be get that we can get our new bodies and we can see him as he really is mm -hmm. and there is no stopping of this new world order why would you stop it because whatever happens here on this earth doesn't have, doesn't play any role for our eternal life. Yeah, that's right. Vengeance is of the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's this, not ours. This world has to pass away to make free the path for the new world and the new heavens. Because this world is corrupt. Absolutely. If it is, if it is on me, I don't want to spend another hour in this corrupt world. Mm-hmm. But it is God who decides. I it gives am, you a big headache just to think about it. I have know? no right to take my own life. Mm -hmm. And nobody else in this world has the right to take my life. There's only one who has the right to take my life, and that's the one who gave it in the first place. And that's God who created right. me and you. Yes. So suicide right, is no solution. And no. murdering others is no solution. Because the new world order will come cost what it may. You have no say in that. It will come. God said it would come. When did he actually say that? Well, therefore, you can even return to the Old Testament. And when you go to the book of Isaiah, and you go to chapter 14, in verse 12, it says, it says How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? Which did weaken the nations. So what did Lucifer do when he fell from heaven and became Satan here on the earth? He weakened the nations. How does he weaken the nations? He takes away the word of God. Continues to say, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. The most important word in these three or four verses that I've just read to you, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, the most important word, what is that, Brett? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on a search right now for something you just okay. triggered. <laughs> okay. 
No. Uh, yeah. Then the I most important the, word is yet. Exactly. The mm -hmm. most important word is yet. So that means mm -hmm. that everything that Lucifer here says will come to fruition. Yet. Thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You can do all that. All right. And everybody who does not listen to me, but listens to you, will go with you, and you will achieve all this. You will weaken the nations. You will achieve all of your plans. Yet, thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So let him do whatever he wants. As long as you have Jesus Christ, you are no part of this. Your body in this world maybe is, but you spiritually stand above those things. At least I hope so. At least I pray so. And I know bread does too. Oh, I was looking for this verse, but I can't find it. Which verse? Hmm. It's in Isaiah. I'm sorry. I, I yeah, wish maybe I can help I, you with I the had search. More, if you, if I wish me. I had more criteria to search with. Probably shouldn't have even. What are your search criteria that. then, Brett? Well, isn't there somewhere in the Bible where it speaks of how everyone will look narrowly upon the man of sin, basically? Yeah. I'm trying to remember where, where they say that. I, I don't think I got the words right because I looked up narrow and I can't find it. I found for thy waste and thy desolate places well, and I, the I, land of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitant. And they swallowed thee up and shall be far away. Well, when you read on in Isaiah 14, it says in verse 16, they that see thee shall mm. narrowly look upon thee Thank and you, consider narrowly. thee, saying, Is this the man that made the yeah. earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that That's made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? There you have it, right in front of you. <laughs> worse. I didn't go where you were. That's the problem. I <laughs> I looked up narrow. It should have been narrowly. Okay, that that was the issue. Yeah, just okay. let me just let me help you. I I typed in my Google search engine, "Look narrowly upon the man Bible," and it comes up with Isaiah fourteen sixteen. So I took that. <laughs> to the Bible well, that's the point. See... Narrowly, not narrow yeah. though. Yeah, I had in my mind narrow, so I typed it into the eSword, and this is what I got. Yeah. I, I was quite sure it was narrowly, but sometimes that helps when you do word searches. But you yeah, know, the, right. the point is okay, we read um, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 with making the point that the most important word of these few verses is the word yet. And then it continues to say, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? that did shake kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of, a, of his prisoners? You know what man is spoken here about? Mm -hmm. The papacy. Absolutely. The, the man of sin. The, the son of perdition. Yeah, the guy that when he sits on the toilet and takes number two, his finger goes through the paper, comes out as brown as yours. Mm -hmm. He is not That's right. God on earth. That's why it no. says here, they that shall that, that see thee when he is brought down to the sides of the pit shall not literally look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? <laughs> why? Why? Yeah. Because How pathetic. he only he only exalts the power that is given to him by the dragon. But the dragon, Satan, only can give the power that God allows him to have. God right. eventually is in control. Never forget that. Mm -hmm. Most important lesson you can probably take out of this reading. 
that I'm going to continue now after three quarters of an hour about. <laughs> and we are going yeah. to read a little bit more. I just love this readings with you, Brett. This is so, All right. so good, wonderful, good. so edifying. Also, going to the Bible back and forth. I oh, just yeah. love doing that. Oh, the spirit's there, brother. Let's keep going. We got to keep keep uh, plugging away. Yeah? And okay. Thank on you the for bottom reading of- so much. You're wonderful. <laughs> on the bottom of page 157, we read then, on May 4th, 1993, Charlie Rose of PBS interviewed the Council on Foreign Relations President Les Gelb. The CFR chief told Mr. Rose, quote, you had me on before for to talk about the new world order it's one world now willing or not ready or not we are all involved unquote now sorry now notice the exact expression is used by the jesuit malachi martin in his best-selling tome the keys of his blood which opens with these uncompromising words willing or not Ready or not, we are all involved in an all-out, no-holds-barred, three-way global competition. Most of us are not competitors. We are the stakes. For the competition is about who will establish the first one-world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. That's after the time of Babel. It is about who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community. Over the entire six billion people expected to inhabit the earth in the third millennium. The competition is all out because now that it has been started, there is is no way it can be called off. Our way of life as individuals and as citizens, even as the badges of our national identity, will have been powerfully and radically altered forever. No one, no, not one, can be exempted from its effects. No sector of our lives will remain untouched, and therefore, you can go to Revelation chapter 13, verses 16, 17, and forward. Mm-hmm. It is not too much to say, in fact, that the chosen purpose of John Paul's pontificate, the engine that drives his papal grand policy, that determines his day-to-day, year-by-year strategies, is to be the victor in that competition now well underway. Unquote. I have to make a little, little, little count. He said, no one can be exempted from its effects. And I happen to disagree. Why? Mm -hmm. Because a true Bible-believing, born-again, Jesus Christ-following Christian is exempted from its effects. You know, we live in the flesh in this world, yeah, and in the flesh we will have the effects, but spiritually we will not have the effects, and that is the most important, because the Bible says, don't don't fear the one who can destroy flesh on earth, but fear him who can destroy... This is Malachi Martin, right? Yeah. (laughs) No wonder. (laughs) But it says, fear him who can destroy flesh and soul in uh, in hell. absolutely right, you're... But Malachi Martin's a Jesuit. <laughs> yes, and that is why. This, this is why. Listen, listen. This is a very important point, Brad. A very important point. Oh, there were already a few people coming Absolutely. to me and asking me, "Why aren't you reading Malachi Martin's The Keys of This Book oh. or any other?" And I always said, "You have to be so careful when you read the book of a Jesuit. You have to be familiar with the casuistry and sophistry and Pope speech into detail." Because otherwise, you will just oh, parrot what they listen, are saying. Listen, this is exactly why Tom expressed so much, um, you know, so upset about this Global Vatican book that he completely 
just exposed. I mean, he did such a magnificent job. I think it just wore him out. Yeah, you know, Brett, the point takes is, a toll. The yeah. point is, most people who read this little uh, paragraph that I just wrote and come to the sentence, no one can be exempted of its effect, they will say, oh, yeah, that's right. There's no escape. But when you say there's no escape, then there is no salvation. Yeah, that's but right. But to me, as a yeah, Bible believing right. Christian, there's salvation in Jesus Christ. I don't have to be part of these quote unquote effects. Let the flesh suffer. I don't care. But, 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 but let you know the soul, I, I want to tell the you a little bit. Let the soul be saved something. by Jesus Christ. Please, you can do so. Just let me finish the sentence. Yeah, and then please, please come, come in. I just want to. I, I just want to give hope to the people when they read yes, a sentence yes, like this yes. and say, please. "No one can be exempted from this." Oh, it's all lost. We're all doomed. No, we're not. That's we are right. saved You're, by our God. Lord Jesus Christ, and this yeah. is something that we should never forget. And that is why it is so dangerous to read yes. the writings of a Jesuit, even though they say a lot of truth. But you can be so easily deceived by this. And the Bible says. Let no man deceive you. That's right. Yep. But I, I made my and point. You know, now, Brett, you, you can take over. Okay. Okay, great. You know, you know I'm a carpenter, and, and you know, uh, I tend to think, you know, a lot of my work, it's really all in the attitude. Okay, if I have a bad attitude at work, well, I can't do my job very well. So I do a lot of dirty jobs. I do a lot of dusty jobs. And uh, generally, you know, um, I just get a good attitude and then it's no problem at all. But, you know, here, part of the thing is this. Okay, so when we're dealing with rotten wood outside in a house and um, there's carpenter ants, people will say, oh, you have carpenter ants. You got to demolish the whole house and start over. Come on. No, the carpenter ants are actually a benefit. And the reason they're a benefit is they tell you you have a problem. When you have a carpenter ant, then you know there's rot in your foundation or something is rotting. You have to deal with it. You have to dig it open and deal with it. Just deal with it. Get it over with. The sooner you deal with it, the better. That's the point. That's, what, that's why I think he put this in bold. I, you know, he didn't italicize it, but he put it in bold that no one can be exempted. It's just telling you there's a problem here. We got to deal with it. You can't just, like Yurk said, just read over it. No, you got to deal with it. Well, we can be exempted from the effects. Don't be spoon fed. Yeah, don't be spoon fed. Yeah, let no man deceive you. That's right. So it just entirely depends on your attitude. And then, you know, all you have to do is find the truth, and then the truth will set you free. That's what Jesus gave us. And indeed, we're free of it, Yerk, in Jesus, but not in this flesh. Jesus made us free of the bonds of this world. Yep. He took the yoke of Rome, and we took his yoke on us, and his yoke is easy. That's right, but the minute you start thinking of the flesh and the fleshly things, guess what? You're it all lost. Flips right around. It flips you're lost. right around on its head, and you're stuck right back where you were. The flesh is like the law; it can do nothing but condemn you. Yep. Only the grace can take you out of that infernal circle. Yep. It's just that simple. Shall I continue reading? Please. <laughs> no holds barred. In other words, by any means necessary, the end justifies the means. On page 341, Malachi Martin writes that the one world government will be, quote, dominated by an international bureaucracy which controls and directs every citizen and every nation for the good of all. For the common good? <laughs> <laughs> he says it's a winner take all race against time if the winner takes it all what is left for the rest of us servitude or a dictatorship take your pick on an earlier page 16 page 13 and some other editions Malachi Martin states quote those of us under 40 
will surely live under its legislative, executive, and judiciary authority and control, a system that will be introduced and installed in our midst by the end of this final decade of the second millennium. Unquote. Always be careful when somebody sets a, a date. Yeah, we are right. almost 20 years after what he writes here, mm. and we still live under its legislative. But we don't live under its executive and judiciary authority and control. Not in the way that I really want to put it. They still don't do this. So be not deceived, not only by any man, but be not deceived by people who set dates. When there is one thing that you will never hear out of my mouth that is predicting a date for something to happen, I will never ever do that. And there are a lot of writers like in this case Malachi Martin who do that. And when that time has come and things that have not happened that way, in that severity, oh, yes. with that consequence, Amen. what does that do to that writer? I mean, oh, he, it labels him a false prophet. Yeah, it, it labels him uh, as as someone who does not know what just he speaks false. about. Huh? Just false. Yeah, just That's false. all. So don't set yeah. dates. You know. No, very unhealthy. We know these it's things in the Bible too. I think it's a, a proverb. Um, you know, don't boast of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day will bring. Yeah, it's just that simple. It is, yeah. Sure. In case you are tempted to dismiss the above revelations of Professor Martin as mere conjectures, permit me to cite his credentials. The back cover of another of his best-selling books, Decline and Fall of the Roman Church, reads, quote, Malachi Martin served three popes as diplomat and spy, speaks 17 languages, a renowned professor at Rome's Pontifical Biblical Institute. He helped translate the Dead Sea Scrolls, unquote. <laughs> You know, we, we, I, I, I mean, I, 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 sometimes I don't get it. How can you read a book of someone with that a high education in the Jesuit realm when you read about what this education in the Jesuit realm does with you? Mm -hmm. You are reading the book of a fortified liar. Mm -hmm. Right. Indeed, Martin is not your average Jesuit scholar. He was a confidant of three popes, a personal friend of John Paul II, and was intimately acquainted with the workings of the Vatican. He had many high-level connections in Rome and around the world, allowing him access to intelligence information on various organizations and governments. Well, let's Malachi Martin also spearheaded sensitive missions for the renowned Jesuit Cardinal Augustine Bea, as well as for Popes John the Twenty Third and Paul the Sixth. By the way, something that I always found intriguing: mm. you have after uh, Antichrist Pope uh, Pius the Twelfth, Pope John the uh, Pope John the Twenty Third, who took mm -hmm. over. And opened Vatican, uh, Vatican II. Yep. And when he deceased, Paul the Sixth took over. Now, oh. first you have John, then you have Paul, and after Paul you had John Paul the First for thirty-three <laughs> days, and then you had John Paul the Second. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Strange that first you have John, then you have Paul, and then you have two times John Paul. It is strange. I think that. But has then the Vatican's really strange. And then John 23rd, there was a John 23rd before this one. Yeah, that and was. And why a quote did he take the name? That was a to quote. To cover unquote, up the old one. That was a quote unquote anti pope. Uh, he wasn't yeah. accepted within the Roman Catholic Church as a pope. That was at the, kind, uh, at the time of. Um, they had, yeah, exactly. So. You know they're they're involved. They're involved with so much uh, really ridiculous history 
you know, they don't want people to discover their ridiculous history. So they, they have to keep changing the name and covering up the old tracks so that you can't tell. You know, that's what Babylon's all about. It's all about Babel. It's all about creating mystery Babel. Mm -hmm. And it's mystery Babel times a billion today. I mean, you just go on the internet and it's all mystery Babel, man. <laughs> well, interesting is La that Lady Gargoyle and all this crap. Come on, Inter man. Interesting is that P.D. Stewart here says that Martin also spearheaded sensitive missions for the renowned Jesuit Cardinal Augustine Beer, a German. And that uh, Cardinal Beer, he was the confessor of Pope Pius XII. Mm -hmm. He was the confessor. And he was the one, who, according, according to uh, Alberto Rivera, who led Alberto Rivera into the uh, archives of the Vatican to get his what? education on, wow. uh, on how to infiltrate the Protestant churches in uh, America. That cardinal. I'm sorry, I'm here. just not as, as awake as you are. Here. <laughs> I'm struggling today. I'm struggling, man. I'm, I'm sorry, Brett. That's not the intent. That's okay. That's okay. I'll get it later, but keep going. Don't let me slow you down, brother. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I keep going, but I will only keep going until the end of the page because we already come to an hour. <laughs> no, the last, <laughs> yeah. the last broadcast was a little lying. less than an hour, and this is going to be a little bit more. That's I can't fine. tell, but I can't stop right now because... Mm. Um, it continues here with the blurb on the earliest version of Martin's book. It states, quote, Only Malachi Martin, consummate Vatican insider and intelligence expert, could reveal the untold story behind the Vatican's role in today's winner-take-all race against time to establish, maintain, and control the first one-world government. Well, this is not the first one-world government. This is the second government. Uh, one world government, as I already explained in the beginning. That's why the new world order is nothing else but the old world order restored. Of course, the old world order was only the Western Hemisphere, because nobody cared about China, nobody cared about Japan, and nobody cared about America, because that wasn't even discovered at that time. Okay? We are speaking mm -hmm. of the known world. Mm -hmm. Now, he co continues, are you not wonderstruck, instead of thunderstruck, are you not wonderstruck as to how a man could be a Catholic priest and an intelligent expert? A spy at the same time? No, I'm not because I know what the general <laughs> education is all about. And that is why that I have to take everything that Malachi Martin writes with a portion of salt. A <laughs> good big one, too. <laughs> Just kidding. It is said that Martin was released from his vows of Jesuit obedience obedience on his own request while remaining a priest. <laughs> Come on! Are you kidding me? So he was a Jesuit for a time, and then he said, oh, no, I, my request, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna retreat off the vows. I am no, I have nothing to do with that anymore. I mean, how stupid must you be to believe that? Huh? However, we well, must remember that Malachi was not yeah. However, we must remember that Malachi Martin was not just an Irish Catholic, but first and foremost a Jesuit. Thus, being called an ex-Jesuit is like being an ex-KGB agent, <laughs> while still on the payroll of the Politburo. And we all know what that implies. <laughs> Martin was also an Oxford scholar, the same university oh. that Freemason Bill Clinton attended as a Rhodes scholar, under the provisions of a will left by another Freemason, Cecil Rhodes. Proof of Clinton's Masonic membership will come later. Now that we have established Martin's credibility, let us see what else he has to say. And this, I'm going to leave you on the top of your chair for the next <laughs> time on page 159. We will go on with that. But I'm well going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, when P.D. Stewart says, Thus, being called an ex-Jesuit is like being an ex-KGB agent. That's an oxymoron. There is no ex-Jesuit, because you only become a Jesuit with the information that Malachi Martin has and the position that Malachi Martin has only when you are trained with the spiritual, sorry, with the spiritual exercise, uh, exercises mm -hmm. until oblivion. You are 
completely um, taking away your own will, your own character. You only do what your superior tells you. You uh, tells you you are a stick in the hand of an old man who does according as he does. Malachi Martin mm -hmm. is not an ex-Jesuit. He is a deceiver from the top of the world. I'm going to tell you that right now. And therefore, you have to be so careful when you read Malachi Martin, when you cite Malachi Martin, you have to be aware that he's a Jesuit, and by that, he is a liar from the beginning. That's right. You got to try the spirits and know the spirits. Can we ask Malachi Martin if what he believes Christ is? Can we ask him if You can Christ ask him whatever he wants, but don't ever rely on his answer. Yeah, that's right, because he'll probably just use mental reservation. He will say whatever you want to hear. That's right. Because the end justifies the means. That's how far it goes with the Jesuits. Yeah. Okay. Um, they just outright lie. We've come to the hour, reading a new world order, willing or not, ready or not, here I come. The new world order will come, and the only solution that there is for you is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Profess Jesus Christ as being born of a virgin, roamed the earth for more than 30 years in his ministry, went to the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins, buried three days later, was resurrected, went up to heaven, and sits right to the next hand of the Father in heaven on the throne. When you do that, and when you confess him wherever you go, then you will be saved, and the New World Order can not hurt you spiritually. It can hurt you no. fleshly, but it cannot hurt you spiritually. With That's this, right. I'm going to sign off and I leave the closing remarks for Brett. Until next time, Juggler, from six, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you and bye-bye. Are we at one of those moments in history in which there is... Uh, the necessity for a new world order. A, because of what's taken place in the Middle East, the rise of, of different kinds of groups, and B, what's happened in Asia, meaning that the, the, there has been a shift from the West to the East. Uh, there's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of, of the world. Are you optimistic a global system can happen, it, from what it, we've heard so far? It, it, it could happen, and in fact it's in the works. Issues, but they really are issues of the construction of a new world order. That's what this is about. And that's the sort of dialogue the Chinese are generally good at. And as and so a partnership between us is essential. A conflict between us is going to exhaust us both in tactical exercises that cannot be conclusive. Order could satisfy both. It has to satisfy both because otherwise it will lead to tensions that will exhaust us both. Much of the turmoil we see on the planet today is a response to a power shift of rising economic prosperity from the west to the east. Three quarters of the world's energy resources are in Eurasia, and whoever ultimately controls these resources will lead the world into a new era of consolidation, a new world order. Regime change in the name of democracy 
and the War on Terror has placed the United States and its allies in key strategic Eurasian regions. Welcome to the birth pangs of a new world order. Leaders and dignitaries of the European Union, representatives of our NATO alliance, distinguished guests. We meet here at a moment of testing for Europe and the United States and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale, nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. This is the world you are graduating into. This is what I want to talk about today with you for a few minutes. I believe we, and particularly you, your class, has an incredible window of opportunity to lead in shaping a new world order for the 21st century in a way consistent with American interest and the common interest. These troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge, a new era, freer from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace. An era in which the nations of the world, East and West, North and South, can prosper and live in harmony. A hundred generations have searched for this elusive path to peace, while a thousand wars raged across the span of human endeavor. And today that new world is struggling to be born. A world quite different from the one we've known. A world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle. A world in which nations recognize the shared responsibility for freedom and justice. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. We have resolved that from today we will together manage the process of globalization to secure responsibility from all and fairness to all also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society. I've been a member of this committee for many years. And I have never seen anything as disgraceful and outrageous and despicable as the last demonstration that just took place about, you know, you're going to have to shut up or I'm going to have you arrested. The ideology of the unification of mankind under one religious, economic and political umbrella has existed since the days of Babylon, when Nimrod built an epicenter of civilization reaching for the sky. United States politicians have demonstrated an almost fanatical zeal in a race against the clock to institute policies asserting U.S. superiority. Nations such as China and Russia are forming re-evaluated alliances and are challenging U.S. hegemony. There is also a religious aspect as well. Behind the scenes, Roman Catholicism has allied itself with the United States and the European elite to ensure Roman Catholicism with its 1.2 billion members is the head, not the tail, of the New World Order. Islam is the rival, with almost 1.6 billion members, and fundamentalist sects like the Shiites not willing to be part of any world order. What for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for 
the coming world government. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. These U.S. politicians are heavily influenced by the military-industrial complex as well as organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderberg Group. But the rabbit hole goes deeper than that. U.S. presidents are well aware of the inherent danger of being assassinated by an unseen power if they choose to go against the grain of a well-hidden secret organization. <laughs> 